Hello, I'm Roger Steer, the Corporate Philosopher and Decision Coach. Welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Series. Roger, great to have you on the series. Uh, you're a good friend. We've known each other many years. And I've, I've found the wisdom um, that you've written about, that you've shared about, uh, spoken about on stages to be incredibly helpful. So tell us a bit now about uh, currently what you're doing and your journey into leadership and some of the things that have shaped um, the, the man you are today and the work you do with organizations. Thank you, Jonathan. It's lovely to be here. And um, I guess what I'm doing at the moment is really doing a lot of thinking and reading and um, concerned about the decisions that are being made by millions, billions of people around the world as we uh, find our way through this pandemic. And uh, I guess my biggest concern is that we're not talking very much or at all about how we're making the critical decisions, the life and death decisions that we need to be making going forward. Um, <clears throat> so that's taking up a lot of, lot of my mental and emotional energy. Uh, I am still working, uh, believe it or not, um, although the work is thinner than it was. So who'd have thought that during a pandemic, people would have been concerned about decision making and improving it? No, they're just running around with their hair on fire, trying to just react to situations instead of thinking through them. And I guess the biggest contradiction and conflict of interest that we're seeing, which is, which is uh, you know, crucial for decision making, is the way that people feel there's a difference between uh, keeping the economy running and defeating the virus. And it's a, what we call a false dichotomy. And uh, you know, we have seen with some, uh, some of our leaders, our national leaders around the world, they're making really good decisions about taking the pain up front. And obviously the, the best case study of that is New Zealand, which effectively put themselves in quarantine. Um, you know, took a, a hit to the economy straight away. But I was reading this morning that people are in New Zealand where there is very little coronavirus, uh, people going out to restaurants, having dinner and going to the theatre. I mean, do you remember that, Jonathan? Wow. And it yeah. just shows you Years how, ago. Exactly. And it just shows you how important it is today for us to stop and think and debate about the decisions that we have to make going forward, both as individuals, as families, as neighborhoods, and indeed as, uh, as companies, as hospitals, as schools, uh, and so on. And of course, our wonderful governments and politicians. And, and those are all fundamental questions. And, and I find it very interesting that you're able to challenge and raise these key issues that, that the the awkward questions, the difficult, knotty issues they, that, that need a sort of Gordian knot kind of approach. How did the journey in life take you to this place where these are the kind of things you're thinking about on the big strategic stage and the, the crucial questions? Take, take me back to Roger as a young man and, and who shaped and influenced you and where did you get your wisdom from as you grew up? What mistakes did you make? That kind of stuff. Yeah, and I guess when as we get older, Jonathan, I'm 63 in March, you look back at your life and think, you know, you know, what was this path I took and why did I take it? So it's a great question. And, and I guess the, um, in many ways, I was both a nonconformist and a conformist. And I think conformity is a really important thing for us to think about at the moment. So there are many good reasons why we need to conform with good, simple rules, but many reasons why we need to be non-conformists uh, in the way we think. So what I mean about that in my childhood, for example, is my dad was a builder and he was a fairly strict Protestant and he literally was a Protestant uh, working class guy. Um, he was a Methodist preacher on a Sunday. So talk about the Protestant work ethic, but of course the Methodist church and the Protestant church is non-conformist. So it was a rebellion, um, if you like, against um, Catholicism and in parts a rebellion against the Anglican establishment in the UK. So there's something about nonconformism which uh, was there early on, but it didn't really come out until I was at university and I had the immense privilege of studying the history of Western philosophy with Conrad Russell, the son of the great British philosopher Bertrand Russell. 
and um, he asked me to critique his father's history of Western philosophy, which is a, a massive tome. And uh, it took me most of the week to read it. And then I had to write an essay to read out in, in our face-to-face -face tutorial. I mean, those were the days, Jonathan, when there were two students, two undergraduate students and a professor sat in a sort of lovely walnut um, panelled uh, study. Um, anyway, so I read out this essay and I was, you know, quite critical. Um, and I took a risk because I just, I just had read it and I, I was as honest as I could be about my critique. So it wasn't all bad. But Conrad sat there, suck, sat there sucking on an empty pipe, because um, even then, you, you know, you weren't able to smoke in a, in a tutorial. And he explained to me that many of my criticisms had, were valid because his father had written this massive tome in just six months to pay off his creditors. So you see this sort of icon of, of you know, the world of philosophers and you get to see the the little story behind it. And I, that just gave me such huge confidence to challenge authority when I felt that something wasn't right. And that has stayed with me uh, throughout my life and career. So I played safe. So um, the conforming Roger, um, I decided to play safe. Uh, and when I graduated, um, my parents, who, you know, were okay um, in terms of their quality of life and standard of living, but I was the first child that had the chance to go to university, went to university, and they were saying to me, you need to get a good job, you need to provide for a family and blah, blah, blah. So I played safe and I applied to all the UK banks as a graduate trainee. I got offered by all of them, <clears throat> but I took the Midland Bank, now HSBC, I took their offer on the very shallow reason they offered the most money. I mean, uh, mm. how shallow can you get? Um, but once I was in, I found it soulless and as boring as hell. Um, because those are the days where even as a fast track get graduate, you spent two weeks filing paper statements in the branch. I mean, how mind numbing is that? And I turned to the manager and said, look, I know my alphabet and I know, you know, zero to nine as a sequence of numbers. Why am I still doing this? And he said, well, you have to do the hard yards when you're leading other people. And I thought, well, there's something in there, but uh, I know what the, my alphabet is and I know how mind numbing this job is. So, so that was conforming and I didn't find it very fulfilling. So uh, my elder brother, David, he had, um, he had a career as a state registered um, psychiatric nurse at one of two youth treatment centers in the UK. Now a youth, these two youth treatment centers, I think they're still running, are where the, if you like, the most horrific offenders are sent, child offenders. So murder, rape, arson, all of that stuff. And uh, I was fascinated by what he was doing. Um, so because of my boredom as a graduate banker, I and there was a sense that I wanted to give something back. So I, I then looked around with his guidance and I started applying for jobs as a residential social worker um in what was called a community head home with education what used to be called in this country a borstal what is known in the us as a reform school basically um you know if you're too difficult to handle in a children's home you go to one of these if you can't make it in one of these you're locked up in a detention center or a community um one of these youth treatment centers and if you like that was my mba in life and um, I found that I was able to do a better job uh, by combining a sort of very simple philosophy that stayed with me ever since. And that philosophy combines two moral values, uh, which I would simply describe as tough love. Now, what I mean by tough love is, uh, let me expand that to be tough on issues and soft on people. So meet the real challenge, the bare, the bare truth head on. Do not avoid confronting reality, but do so with compassion and care because you're dealing with fellow human beings. And that 
in that sort of fairly intense environment, where there's a lot of suffering and abuse and, and so on, I found that worked extremely well. So what these young people needed more than ever was the safety of a structure of not of harsh discipline, but basically knowing that there were, there are boundaries to their behavior. And if they step over that boundary, there is a consequence. Um, and, uh, and I learned that very quickly. I mean, they were quite tough in a London uh, kids, uh, teenagers, many of them from um, uh, ethnic backgrounds. Um, and, you know, I've always been quite short in stature. So when confronting a very angry, large uh, youth who is about to throw a chair around your head, it actually is, is quite a quite a good way, quite a good training ground. I mean, not that I would be allowed to do that in that way now, but it, it, it meant that they, they trusted me to care enough about them to take all their SH1T, if I can put it that way. And at the same time that they knew that actually I did care. And so we'd spend most of our time doing fun things because the boundaries had been set and accepted. And so I, I was a lot fitter now then than I am now. Um, and so we used to play in the gym and play table tennis and all sorts of stuff. And, and, that, and that, if you like, that non-conforming leap from banking into residential social work was, I guess, the best learning, second best learning experience of my life. And then, then I um, got married first time around and uh, being a residential social worker is not much above what would be national living wage now. So in order to buy a house, I had to think about a job that paid a bit more money. So I put my knowledge of banking and delinquency together and became a headhunter in the city. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, it's, a, it's funny, but it's, there's a grain of truth in that because one of the things I've discovered that you, I know Jonathan, you and I have talked about constantly is the fact that, and it's not just true of banking, it's true of many, many occupations many leaders are socially delinquent. They have what psychologists call the dark triad traits of narcissism, Machiavellianism and psychopathy. Um, they're the sort of people who, if we had a functioning uh, society that believed in tough love, would be under some sort of treatment program, but instead we promote them into positions as CEOs and uh government ministers or even prime ministers dare i say um and and i guess that those insights and those truths have helped me to develop my professional practice as the corporate philosopher and the decision coach over the last 20 years um uh, and i also had after i um became a headhunter I had the critical experience of become a divisional CEO of a multinational corporate so that was quite interesting to understand the mass machinations of of corporate life which is which is mind-numbing in its complexity and bureaucracy it is I would say 80 percent inefficient because um, for, for reasons that maybe we'll expand on in a second but the headline there is that the joint stock corporation, and in fact, many public sector organizations, maybe some elements of, um, of service, such as the military, the police, and so on, um, are structured like medieval kingdoms where power is vertical. It's not democratic. I mean, we've just seen in the last month an attack on a physical attack on democracy in the United States. And yet, even though many of us talk about the ideals of democracy, we collude with feudalism when we go to work. I mean, how insane is that? We don't elect our leaders. They're appointed by other people who themselves have been appointed ultimately by people with money and or other forms of power. I mean, 
democracy in the political sense is uh, does exist, but actually it's not as powerful as people think because our working lives are largely rooted in a medieval uh, power construct. And I'm not some sort of raving communist um, and I'm not advocating sort of revolution, but I asked the question of CEOs and senior leaders, um, if there was an election tomorrow, do you think you'd be re-elected or elected as the CEO or uh, you know, chief financial officer or head of human remains, sorry, human resources or whatever it, it is your position is? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely fascinating, this thing about do they, do they have the right to, to rule, the right to lead? And why would anybody be led by them? I am interested, just going briefly off tangent because it's quite topical. What, in a, in a nutshell, what was your reading of how did it come about that Donald Trump, with no political experience, being a reality TV show wrestling um, celebrity, suddenly becomes the most powerful man in the world, and yet despite the excellent BBC program, which captured all the things about him groping people and you know all sorts of disgusting behavior that he did and colluding with Russia and stuff like that. How did he get away with it all for so long and still, um, and then cause the run on the capital? I mean, what's, it's a, it's a big topic, but what, what is your reading of it? Because you always have a very interesting reading of situations. Yeah. I don't always. So, so I, I'm, I tend to react. So I trust my intuition a lot. And as you were asking the question, I was thinking that the presidency in the United States over the last four years has been a reality TV show. Yeah. So, uh, and I think politics now is pretty much a reality TV show. Um, and that's why politicians very rarely answer questions honestly. Um, they read from a script. Um, they are coached and, and you know, uh, to do and say what their leaders tell them to do and say. Um, I am, I also think there's an element here of understanding that politics is about tribal hatred. And one of the things that we have always been guilty of as a species is, is tribal hatred, is difference. And despite all the wokeness that's being proliferated and talked about around the world, um, in many ways, it doesn't matter if it's about racism or whatever it is. Um, there is a, still a fundamental challenge to, if you like, being compassionate to others, which is about our tribal hatreds and discomfort with people of difference. And yeah. it doesn't matter what the difference is. It can be the fact that you, you believe that coronavirus is, a, is, is fake. It doesn't exist. Um, our son daughter-in-law and grandson live in the Netherlands and they have riots at the moment uh, going on because enough Dutch people believe that all the lockdown measures are unnecessary. I mean, they've got riot police on the streets. I thought it was bad here. And we thought, well, thank goodness they're in the Netherlands, but actually, really. So, so my reflection on, on politics is it's about tribal hatred and I think the only way to get around this is a sort of enforced truth and re reconciliation. And by enforced, I mean force of circumstances. So look, the biggest threat we, threats we face, uh, coronavirus is a symptom of our, you know, humanity is at, in a suicidal war against the natural world. Mm. That was something said by our current UN General, uh, Secretary General uh, in the last few days. Humanity is in a suicidal war against the natural world. So it's not just climate change, it's species extinction. It's the destruction of our biosphere and coronavirus is one example of that. Um, and I think there's also another thing which goes with it is that we have not understood what intelligence is. So if you do an IQ test, and this goes to your model, Jonathan, um, about your various IQs, EQs, MQs, which we'll talk about a bit later and so on, is that intelligence, IQ, 
it has no objective scientific validity. It was the original designer designed IQ, the intelligence test, in order to help identify those children who had a different sort of intelligence from the sort of things that we measure in an IQ test. Then he died before it was properly developed and it got hijacked to do the opposite, which is to identify and develop people with a certain narrow form of intelligence which is still determining uh, who we promote or appoint to leadership positions today. But it is not what psychologists call adaptive intelligence and adaptive intelligence in a way the coronavirus has more adaptive intelligence than we do. Yeah. Uh, it's just built into its RNA. Yeah. So the fact that we are getting mutations all the time that we know nothing about shows that a very simple edge of life form is able to adapt to whatever we're doing. It has no consciousness as far as we can tell, but we we are not developing and, and promoting adaptive intelligence. Um, and I'm sure at the same time, I mean, many of your other guests um, in the Inspiring Leadership series who have a military training and background do know what we mean by adaptive intelligence because the whole mission command ethos is about training your your soldiers and your airmen and sailors to make adaptive intelligent decisions in real time under fire and and that is not something we do outside of the military to some extent you're seeing it emerging within tech but even then i think it's quite constrained yeah. um so I, I don't know why and how I got down that rabbit hole, Jonathan. But... It, was, it was a fascinating one. And, and before I move on to your darkest and your, and your proudest moments in your career, I, I would like to pick up some very interesting themes. One is I'm listening to General Stanley McChrystal and uh, also having a, a number of other special forces and generals like James Bashel, who were in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, tribalism, obviously in Afghanistan, you had the Pushtans and, and other tribes fighting each other. And they'd been there. And of course, we being British, we'd put a border right down um, the middle of the stands. We hadn't worked out where the tribes were. We'd put it in the middle of the two <laughs> Afghanistan, just like, just like we'd done in so many other crisis yeah. places. But, but there you've got tribal hatred going back hundreds of years. Now we've got what Nancy Klein talks about in her excellent book, The Promise That I that changes everything, I won't interrupt you. Um, you've got polar, polarization in this country, you've certainly got it big time in America, and, and people are playing to that hatred. Um, and, and it's really, really very worrying. But look, fascinating, and, and the adaptive intelligence, just thinking about McChrystal, he was watching what the Taliban were doing, and they put a new brochure out about how they were gonna behave. He was doing counterinsurgency, he had to have a counter countermeasure to their measure, um, and yes, the military, we always learned to, in my 20 years, to, to think what the other side's doing and how do you adapt to that or how can you get, can you steal a march on them by a different tactic? And then the final point that you'd said so well was the RNA sequencing. And I know some of the scientists at the Sanger Institute, part of the Wellcome Trust, they were saying back in October that all 34,000 elements of the RNA that makes up COVID was changing one at a time. And they could see that, they could see that happening back then. Mm. Um, and this thing will mutate and, and it will adapt. And, and we've got to be able to do that with it. Fascinating area, but we just, I'm fascinated in many other aspects that I'd love to hear from you. Proudest uh, moments in your career thus far and a dark moment in personal life or work or both and, and what you learned from those. Well, in many ways, Jonathan, I think they're connected. They are often the same, the same event, the same crystallization is a bit of yin and yang. It's both and. Um, and I, I'll be honest with you, I'm very uncomfortable with the term proud. Um, and I'll tell you why. I think, I think an excess of pride, which we call narcissism, is the root cause for many of our ills today. And you and I have talked in the past about the um, very depressing amount of humble bragging that goes on in LinkedIn, for example, 
And I feel compassion towards those people because they're obviously deeply insecure and have to tell the world that they're very humbled to be awarded this, that and the other or to be promoted. Um, and, and I just find it leaves me cold uh, other than a note, a mental note to myself that, you know, I should feel compassion and sorry for people who feel that insecure. And in fact, um, there's a very famous book, and I can't remember which philosopher wrote it, a Br British philosopher, um, called Status Anxiety. And status anxiety is actually um, a greater root cause of many of our ills, not just in a mental or psych psychological sense, but also in a material sense. So our desire to acquire stuff and things, which is, um, you know, a, a misaligned purpose for our economy um, is a form of addiction and in a form of narcissism. So, you know, my success is determined by the number of cars sitting on my drive, um, the length of my drive, the number of bedrooms in my house, where I go on holiday and so on and so forth. So that status anxiety is very real. And in fact, a little footnote there, the whole debate around excessive executive pay misses the point. It's not about the monetary value that they are awarded, it's the status they acquire. So, um, you know, your, your quality of life does not increase that much if your take home pay rises from, you know, doubles from a million to two million. It actually doesn't change that much. It changes if you go from a million to a billion, uh, and it changes if you're like Elon Musk or um, Jeff Bezos, and it goes from a billion to a hundred billion. Yes, that is life changing. Um, but for most of us ordinary folk, you know that that um, that narcissism, that status anxiety, is a very real um, challenge to us. So, going back to your question, I'm not comfortable with proud. Which what is what happiest, the happiest moment in your life? Well, yes, and, and the one that, yes, so I, I quite like the word joy. A joyful moment in your life. A joy, so joyful moments are, and it's not just, you know, I'm not going to give you a, a sort of predictable list of, you know, my wedding days. I've been married twice, so <laughs> if I talked about the first and not the second, I'd be in deep trouble, although <laughs> the second was actually much, much a much more joyful day. And then she can't hear this. She's um, she's upstairs. I think. Um, and the birth of our grandson and stuff like that. That's that's taken for granted. But for me, joy, joys in life are my joys in life have been when the work I have done with people, I can see something switch back on in their behind their eyes and in their faces. And I see joy in their faces and I see that aha moment when they begin to realize and they connect the dots and see that their life and all their work might be a bit better if they applied some of the, the, this question and thinking that we're exploring today. So it's difficult to identify any one moment because there's been a lot of them and that sustained me. And I guess I am at my most joyful and happy that I prefer joy to happiness as a as a um, a word. When I am in front or working with a group of people, and it, I call them gigs, and it's a bit like my son, who's a musician. It's a bit like you know, um, although I'm an introvert, when you're doing a gig, Jonathan, you know what this is like. You you are in some form of control, and providing you're at least competent then it will go well. And if you know your stuff, it will go well because the audience will be on your side very quickly when they know they don't have to be embarrassed about a poor gig. I mean, that is the worst thing for an audience to think of that whoever stood in front of them is just going to crash and burn. Yeah. So, so, so my, the joy and happiness I have is to work with individuals and groups of individuals and see the lights go back on, see the clouds lifted. Um, darkest moments? Darkest moments are, uh, that's difficult because I, I don't think I've experienced, I don't see life like that. I see, um, I, mean, I've, um, I mean, I've had some tough moments, as, as you know, my, my wife's family uh, has had 
incredible challenges around the death of um, a member of the family, the murder of a member of the family, uh, which has been incredibly dark and, and being three meters away from a serial killer uh, is very dark. Um, but I think knowing how to help people in that situation is very connected to the first, the, the joy and the happiness. So I wouldn't say I felt joy, but I, I felt that if I could be a rock and or an anchor to mix metaphors for my wife and for her remaining children, um, that would be the way to get through a dark moment. Yeah, yeah. No, and I find that easy, Jonathan, easier than many because I, um, I have this ability to feel compassion, but sometimes at a, at a thought level rather than the feelings level. So um, I will cry at the TV when there's, and I'm not, not just with laughter, but I'll also, you know, my wife will turn around and say, are you crying at this? I said, yeah, because I find it very moving. Mm. Um, but I'm also able to detach myself from situations where I can see people are in distress and I can function in a way that perhaps people in uh, in healthcare, in the military, in in you know in the police, the fire service can function when all around them uh, people are in distress yeah. and dying or suffering, whatever it is. Mm. Um, and, and and so uh, so. I'm not sure about dark moments. I'll tell you what my fear is. I, f I don't fear death. I fear a painful death. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. I was talking, I was, I've done some work with boards in the NHS and I was talking to one non-executive director who is a GP in practice. So sometimes NHS trusts obviously bring clinicians in and obviously an important one would be a GP representative. And I said, we were talking about purpose. I said, what do you think the purpose of medicine is? And he gave me the best answer that I've ever heard, which is to relieve suffering. Mm. What he didn't say was to cure all known diseases, including death itself. Yeah. And, and it's the and, National uh, Illness Service rather than National Health Service. And we need to start looking at yeah. issues that will promote health much more than focusing just on dealing with the consequences of people living a toxic, um, unhealthy lifestyle. Yeah, and also, you know, to recognize that, that death is part of life and it's inevitable. So it worries me in some ways that we have decided that, um, dreadful though it is, that 100,000 people dying from within 28 days of a coronavirus test, positive coronavirus test, is worse than 100,000 people dying of cancer or of um, uh, suicide or even starvation. So you will have seen my LinkedIn posts. I did one last week where I noted that the tragedy of 2 million people around the world dying of coronavirus in the last 12 months, but also noting that in the same period of time, 9 million people have died of hunger, mm. for which we have a vaccine called food. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and so I, it worries me that um, that we don't, it's not, almost not allowed to, to talk about this thing because everybody's supposed to be focused on dealing with coronavirus and we don't seem to care as much about um, partners being abused, children being abused, people not getting schooling and so on. And I'm not advocating that we return to normality before we defeat this virus, but I think we need to have a more balanced, coherent discussion about why we think this is so much worse than someone suffering physical or mental abuse or all the people not going to A&E when they've had a stroke or a heart attack because they're worried about catching coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a, a very large issue. And, and taking yourself back, um, to your younger self when you were 18 and, and, and kicking around um, doing the residential uh, social worker and the, and the time filing things in the bank at, to the Midland, um, knowing what you know now, and, and you know, you've read and you've written and, and accumulated 
a wealth of wisdom from different people and from your own mistakes and learning and humanity and humility. Um, what one bit of advice would you give your 18 year old self knowing what you know now, Roger? Um, I'm not sure the 18 year old could have done much about it, but looking back and thinking forward, um, I think as an 18 year old, even earlier as a child, so young children are sponges when it comes to experience and knowledge, they have curiosity. And yet our education system um, pretty much damps that down and sometimes eliminates it. And instead of exploring, we're force fed a diet of stuff that allows us to perform or not perform of our, along very narrow lines of ability and intelligence. I wish that when I was four, 11, and 18, I had had the opportunity to, to have that, that ability to explore and be curious and to learn outside of the tram lines of our formal education system, which I think is incredibly badly designed and is turning out homo economicus instead of homo sapiens or homo empathicus. Mm. Um, and, and it's interesting, uh, if you look at our society today and societies around the world, again, I can't remember who said this, but someone once said, you can judge the, the quality of a community or society by the way it educates its children and the way it cares for its uh, elderly and infirm. Mm. And if you apply that test, to the way you vote in any election and you make an informed decision, I believe we'll get a better society and a better world. Because I don't think that, you know, I'm, I'm worried and I'm concerned about the people who are losing their jobs in retail, for example. But then you step back and think, what is retail all about? If it's about literally um, you know, your daily bread, that's fine. We need to eat. But do we need to replace our smartphones every year? Do we need a takeaway spicy chicken meal all the time? What is it we actually need to lead a good and wholesome and fulfilling life? And we don't need much of what we've constructed as a so-called modern economy, because it's, to repeat um, this uh, insight, humanity is in a suicidal war against the natural world. And one of the things I've actually enjoyed in lockdown is thinking about the simplicity of what we actually need rather than the complexity of our wants. It is, it is really, uh, speaking on a personal level, and just, um, because money is tight in this current recession, I'm having less stuff. And it's just things that's food or the, the basic essentials to keep the house running, but actually a lot of replacements for things that can go on for another few years. I don't need another new iPhone. I don't need another set of earphones. These ones don't work well, but they're okay. So I'll carry on with them. It, it's back to, I think, what our parents brought us up with. And I know my mother was you know, brought post-war and, and she was a single mother would bring up three boys age 33 but you know it's make do mend or do without um, and if you want it you save up for it and you buy it when you can afford it uh, and we've got into a really bad state I think for the rest of the time that we've got on our call I'd like to focus on just one element of the inspiring leadership compass which is your specialism uh, which is moral quotient integrity values beliefs principles because you've written to two or three cracking books, uh, Ethic Ability. Um, do you want to tell us about the other books that you've written? And let's just talk about integrity because it, it is key in the topic we're having about stuff we buy and how we look after people, how we educate our children, how we look after the old and the infirm. Just yeah. tell us a bit about, about your books, would you? Thanks, Jonathan. I, I, I'd love to. Um, 
So the core one around morality is two books. So it's Ethic Ability, um, which I wrote in December 2005, and it was published in March 2006. Um, so because I wrote it in a month, you'll gather it's not a very long book. Well, you've, you've read it, so you know it's so. Um, and I wrote it because um, the history of moral philosophy is quite tortuous. And I, I think I equate it to really a bit like an, a literature degree. So it's all well and good reading the original texts of whoever it is, Aristotle or Hume or any of the other great philosophers. But actually um, what people need is to understand moral philosophy in a simpler way because the application of what is, um, I think, quite a simple framework is still pretty tough. So, and the reason why people don't make better decisions is because uh, philosophers love to use very long words like consequentialism, which is relatively easy to understand, um, deontology, which is less easy to understand, in order, I mean, there's a bit of narcissism there, which is, you know, philosophers love to think they're really smart. Um, and the question is, are they really? I mean, uh, anyway, so I decided that- how, how do you stop yourself from coming across as thinking yourself too smart? Because it must be a constant battle, certainly as for me, I stop trying to brag, as you say. Yeah. What do you do to stop yourself coming across as a bit smug and, and alienated? I, um, it's a good question and one that I maybe I can't answer. So. Maybe uh, people watching this uh, this interview can tell me how well I'm or how well I'm not doing in terms of explaining things simply. And I um, I guess one of my watchwords around the whole moral intelligence thing and my approach to it is Einstein's dictum, which is if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it. E equals mc squared. Now I'm not saying that. Uh, the theory of relativity is easy to understand, but he managed to compress it into a very simple looking equation, even though it's complex. And so the reason I wrote Ethical Ability and the Precy of it, which is how to do what's right and how to do what's right, by the way, for anyone uh, watching or listening to this is available as a free ebook downloadable from my website, uh, which we'll talk about maybe at the end. Yeah. Um, ethic ability is the longer version, but effectively what I did was to distill the three dominant forms of, uh, of schools of moral philosophy into uh, three simple words and concepts. So philosophers talk about um, consequentialism or utilitarianism, which means uh, can mean the greatest happiness for the greatest number. That was how it was defined by British philosophers in the 18th century. Um, but that's actually talking about love and our concern for people. So I call it people now. I used to call it the social conscience or the ethic of care. It doesn't matter, it means the same thing. So uh, the first and perhaps most important moral conscience, uh, because without it, we cannot bring children into the world and raise fragile infants into functioning adults is love, compassion, the ethic of care, and thinking about the consequences of our actions on other people. Yeah. So that's people or love or care. That's the first moral um, compass or moral um, lens, if you like. The next one is what philosophers call virtue ethics, what we would describe perhaps as moral values. So what are the moral values that help you to make a tough decision, which will have good outcomes for people. And those moral values are conceptual principles such as fairness, wisdom, excellence, humility, their character traits or um, themes, if you like. It's a bit like jazz, which help us to make decisions. They're flexible, they're adaptive to, to go back to our last discussion. They're not tram lines, they're, they're guides. So that's the second one. And the third one uh, is what philosophers call the deontological perspective from the Greek deon meaning duty, or it actually means the rules. So we do need a few simple rules to keep us safe and to stop us from harming others. 
so rules are very important, but they're far too important in the way that life and business is led today. Um, so for me, there is really only one or two rules. I would say two rules. One is, and they're connected. One is um, be kind to others, brackets, don't hurt other people. And the second one is share stuff fairly according to our needs, uh, brackets, don't be greedy. Yeah. If you apply those two rules, they're actually, you can argue they're meta principles, they're actually moral principles, but if you, you can talk about them as rule, because a lot of the rules we have uh, look as if they're black and white, but they're not. So if you look at a rule which says, do not kill other people or do not allow harm to come to other people, what do you do when you have a limited amount of resources in order to save lives? So you're in an ICU in a, an NHS hospital at the moment and you've run out of ventilators. Who gets put on a ventilator and how do you make that decision? Mm. That's a judgment call and it's a really difficult yeah. judgment call yeah. by human beings about the lives and well-being of other human beings. Now, one of the things I would say about that is actually we might have a moral obligation to, if you like, almost have like a living will, which would say to a medic in these circumstances, do not resuscitate. We have DNOR um, things anyway, but to say in a situation where you have to choose between my life and the life of a, a younger person, whatever it is, choose the life of the younger person. Or someone who is likely to recover has a greater chance of recovery than I have. So, so some of that, that goes back to um, if you're having a rule, you need to make sure that the people who are having to comply with the rule um, has a voice in, in uh, creating that rule or applying it. So, so that's a summary of the three main moral philosophies. And just staying with the, those three, which are very interesting, I think you, you're alluding to another fascinating discussion that's going on among doctors that I know. And they go, so we're giving the vaccine out. We're giving it to the 90 year olds and then the 80 and then the 70 and so on. People who've got asthma and that are more susceptible. What are we, why are we giving it to the 90 year old who's dribbling and has got incontinence and Alzheimer's and actually is a huge burden on society when actually they, in some ways it sounds cruel, but they perhaps could be let to go because there are people who are younger who are trying to look after children and get a job going and keep the economy going. Why can't they have it quicker? I, I don't know what your thought is on how do they decide? So it's a debate that we need to have in our, in our communities, in our society, and people before they, while they're able to make a, an intelligent decision, need to be allowed to have a, a set of wishes that are respected. So um, my wife and I already have DNORs, we have living wills, um, we're, we are able to make decisions about each other's health and welfare, well-being. We have um, lasting powers of attorney for each other. And we will make decisions based not on extending life for its own sake, but on the quality of the life that remains. And my wife sometimes jokes and says to me, I hope one day, you know, uh, when I need it, you'll shoot me. And, I, you know, we laugh. And it's a bit of a gallows human, but we both know what we mean. And so I think that the decisions that medics are having to make, in a way, it shouldn't be their decisions to make on their own. Yes, they should be able to make those decisions at the moment, but they should be in decisions informed by the wishes of the people that are there. And they should be decisions that we're discussing on TV in programmes that are important rather than the bullshit that yeah. actually... But, you know, game shows, I can't stand watching game shows because, you know, it's to me, it's a waste of time. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you touched on something very dear to me when my mother had a stroke and was terribly ill and then a second stroke. Um, often doing powers of attorney and DNR, you do it too late mm -hmm. uh, and you can't even have the conversation with them. And the same again with Lee's mother, who sadly passed away in August and we cared for her for three years when she got 
uh, steadily worse with her Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease and lung disease. Um, you need to be able to have those available, almost like everybody should fill them in anyway, sort of mm -hmm. almost on an annual renew. Is this what you still want as a couple? And, and you yeah. just made me think I, I need to do that with Lee. So if, if anything happens like the terrible situation with my brother being attacked um, yeah. weeks ago, that, that, that we have these things in place. I think you're very, very shrewd to do that. And it's made me think. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think that, so clinicians are having to make really tough ethical decisions at the moment, but we shouldn't be putting them in, in those situations without a greater degree of confidence that they are reflecting the will of the people. No, no sense very, very and, helpful and i i really think that we would do well to invest in those debates and arguments and conclusions as part of whatever we do in rebuilding our society um and it worries me that uh, too much public policy is being driven by um tribal hatred yeah yeah. Because that's what we discussed earlier. That's my definition of politics. It's tribal hatred. It's not going to get us to a better place. No. And in our last five minutes, I'd just like to open it up for any of the themes. You, you know the kind of topics that we were going to talk about. But what we've discussed has been fascinating. So I wanted to stay with those topics. But perhaps would you just share, as you, as you look through some of the things that we were going to discuss about, any of the tips that you'd pass on to people on any of the topics from your experience or the organizations you've worked with. And, yeah. then, and then before we, we come to a close and we'll then later on record the one minute uh, tip, but um, before we come to a close, maybe you could share your, your website so people could go there and, and read more about it. But what would you give us some of, yeah, maybe two or three of your, of your tips on any of the topics that we were gonna talk about? Yeah, um, so I guess, I, I guess, and it's something I've been doing a lot recently uh, is really thinking about and doing this this Einstein distillation of simplicity, making s something simple, complex, and trying to look back and understand what it is I actually do to help people. Because <laughs> when you're doing, you can't quite see the wood for the trees. And I've, I, I think I've come to some interim conclusions. Um, and there's something I want to introduce into this that we haven't talked about before. We've touched on it, but but understanding. Uh, the complexity of life and the simplicity of systems theory. So what I mean by that is the analogy I use is that I'll hold up a glass of water uh, at an event and ask the question, what is this? Yeah, it's obvious. And I say, okay, and what form is it in? It's a liquid. Okay. So, and what temperature do you think it is? It's about 23 degrees, whatever the ambient temperature is. And I'll say, okay, good. So, Oh, what would we have to do to turn it into a solid? We'd have to reduce the temperature 23 degrees and then it becomes a solid, but it's still water, still H2O. What if we then supercooled it from minus one to minus 100 degrees centigrade? What would it be? It'd still be a solid. Okay, let's go back up the temperature scale. Let's take this liquid um, and we'll heat it from 23 degrees to 93 degrees. So we've just increased the temperature by 70 degrees. It's still a liquid. But if we increase the temperature eight degrees from 93 to 101, it turns from a, a liquid into a gas, but it's still H2O. Now, what I find is that most of us make bad decisions and think, make errors of thinking and judgment because we believe the world is binary and or linear. It's not. So I have learned that I can help people, I can help leaders and teams at the team level only. It's, so you get a lot of consultants going around earning hundreds of thousands and millions of pounds in fees, claiming to transform organizations and cultures. That is fake. It cannot happen at that level. The only way you can actually allow people to be at their best is to work at the leader and team as a coherent entity within a complex system. Now, obviously the board of an entity and the senior executive team have more influence on other teams than other teams do. 
So, but you should only talk, you should only focus on them as teams. And I guess what I've realized over the last five years in particular, and, and I guess the last two years as well, is I have seen organizations transform from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas by focusing on, if you like, the melting point and the boiling point. And that means to transform, to help people make better decisions, to think and make better decisions and arguments within a team, within this thing called a meeting. Yeah. And a meeting, most meetings in most organizations are a complete waste of time or they're badly designed. If you need to have an important question to debate and answer, you need to have a methodology to do that. And having an ethical framework is part of that. It's not the only thing. But crucially, you need to create an environment uh, of curiosity, openness, argument, debate, and uh, a self-aware environment so that people can make better decisions together. And if you do that at every team level and every in every team, every senior team, there are leaders of other teams, as we know. And if you do that, then the change can happen uh, with an R factor of two rather than an R factor of one or minus one. And, and that's how change happens. And it can happen in, you know, I've seen it twice happen in six months. Brilliant. Roger, there's so many things we could talk about, but our time has come to oh, an end. No. Um, what, what a journey it's been. Thank you very much indeed, um, Professor Roger Steer, the corporate philosopher, the decision coach. Um, really enjoyed that. Uh, thank you for being on the series. Thank you, Jonathan. So my top tip as a leader is to hum. And what I mean by that are three hums that should inform your leadership. The first one is humanity. Leadership is about caring deeply for the people that you're leading. The second one is humility, is get over yourself. It's not all about you. It's about the team and the team's purpose and mission. You are actually, you should be leading from behind, not in front. You should be coaching and encouraging people and allowing people who are at the front line to do their job. You're there as support. And the third and final one is humour. Why humour? Because it is a device that our brains absolutely love in times of stress, the endorphins that come out when we find something to laugh at, laugh at even in the darkest moments, enables us to continue to function in a way which I think we've, we are losing far too much. So be humming, hum as a leader, humour, humility and uh, humanity. <laughs>